everyone. Today is Tuesday, February 12th, and um, this video is actually going to be um, following up on this text by Dr. Bullard called Unequal Protection. What exactly is the environmental justice conception that's been developed by um, Dr. Robert Bullard? And can we find job opportunities in these areas um, that help us do more for um, advocacy for the environment? I'm just going to read from page... One second here. I'm going to read actually from the introduction. And in my last video, I read one, two, three, four, I can't remember, five paragraphs. So I'm going to pick up on paragraph six on page XV1, XVI, and I'm um, going to just read a little bit about the need to address environmental injustice the way that Dr. Bullard actually conceptualizes it. So from chapter or paragraph 6. In many instances, government is the problem. Residents of communities such as Northeast Houston, West Dallas, East Los Angeles, South Tucson, Tucson or Chicago South Side are not looking to government to save them from industrial polluters. The impetus for changing the environmental protection apparatus has not come from within the regulatory agencies, the polluting industries, or the industry that has been built around risk assessment. For the most part, the environmental justice movement, a loose alliance of grassroots and national environmental and civil rights leaders, academics, and activists, has provided the vision and leadership in challenging the shortcomings of the current environmental protection model. So from this, one of the things that we can begin to question is what exactly is our local environmental protection model and how does it actually cater to our interests as people from a racialized community? Activists have targeted disparate enforcement, compliance and policy formulation as they affect environmental and public health decisions making on a wide range of issues from toxic waste to urban transportation. They have borrowed many of their tactics from the civil rights movement. Environmental justice activists have not limited their tactics to demonstrations in the streets, but have begun to mount legal challenges to unequal protection by government decision makers and industrial firms. What do grassroots leaders want? These leaders are demanding a shared role in the decision making process that affect their communities. They want participatory, participatory democracy to work for them. They are challenging the background assumptions that drive risk-based decision-making, industrial policies that pit jobs against the environment, and housing policies that force families to choose between childhood lead poisoning and homelessness. All these policies have a disparate impact, whether intended or unintended, on the quality of life in low-income areas and communities of color. Why has it taken so long for government to act, to, to act affirmatively in reducing environmental inequalities? The environmental justice message is beginning to filter into the mainstream of government and non-government organizations, NGOs. There's still a lot of work to be done in catching up in educated and in convincing some public officials that environmental disparities are real and that environmental racism exists. Nevertheless, several events in the early 1990s brought these concerns to the national public policy debate. And then if you read on page XVII and XVIII, there are several events that are listed there. And then we can go to say, current environmental decision making operates at the juncture of science, technology, economics, politics, special interests, and ethics and mirrors the largest social milieu where discrimination is into institutionalized. Why do some communities get dumped on while others escape? Why are environmental regulations vigorously enforced in some communities and not in others? Why are some workers protected from environmental threats while others, such as migrant farm workers, are allowed to be poisoned? How can environmental justice be incorporated into the environmental protection models? 
what community organizing strategies are effective against environmental racism. Now stopping at X1X page, one of the things that we have to contend with in reading with this text is why exactly are environmental justice issues of importance to us? Some people um, have no ability to even think about what environmental injustice is because it doesn't even affect them whatsoever. And then you have other communities that deal with this every day for generations. So how do we actually come to some kind of position where we can say, okay, you know what? Everybody can collaborate on solutions. We all want the best for the next person regardless of difference of position, sexuality, gender identity, uh, social location, um, how do we actually come to some kind of consensus around environmental protection for everyone? And excuse me for scratching my nose, but um, I'd like to hear your thoughts around environmental justice from that perspective. We just heard a little bit about some of the problems, the problem elements of environmental injustice. We're looking at governance, we're looking at even inclusion. I mean, if we're in a model of participatory democracy, why doesn't it work for locals when we try and promote this model internationally? And how can we actually get people engaged in the environmental movement? The environmental movement isn't a color-coded movement. It's a movement to try and engage everyone in issues related to air, land, water, soil, and their human health. So um, this is just another episode of Environmental Justice. Let me know what your thoughts are around um, Dr. Bullard's conception around the elements contributing to environmental injustice and how can we actually collaborate around solutions. Thanks for watching.